slide, please. Thank you. So, thank you so much for the this opportunity, and it is really a pleasure to talk to all of you. So, my talk is uh, brief on the arbovirus situation. Actually, in 2019, early itself, in the beginning of the year, WHO listed dengue among the 10 diseases with potential for outbreak in that year. And it was, it turned out to be true. And we had a huge increase in dengue in over 40 countries. Now, many of you know the reasons for the increase in dengue. It is seasonal, uh, usually soon after rain. Uh, the climate changes have started to bear uh, on, on the disease and uh, the El Nino phenomenon in the Pacific is another interesting uh, area where we, we are in a position now to almost predict a potential outbreak. So there is uh, uh, intensified rainfall in many parts of the world. And of course, the old uh, topics of unplanned urbanization uh, pop and population growth, increased travel, uh, the implementation of vector control has been erratic. And of course, in, in populations, there is waning immunity among uh, various virus serotypes. So many factors today favor the transmission of dengue, the geographic uh, patterns of distribution. The mosquitoes have silently expanded its distribution to over 150 countries. And this is shocking because we are not keeping abreast with vector surveillance. Their reproduction and feeding patterns have all helped in their growth and transmission of dengue. Next slide, please. So this was an outline. Basically, the, this data is not fully up to date, but I must admit that these are some of the countries which recorded the highest number of cases in 2019. And uh, as uh, Luis has already said, Brazil had high number of cases. Then, of course, we had in Asia, the main number was from Philippines, Vietnam, Sri Lanka, Malaysia, Indonesia and so on. So there, and even in Bangladesh, actually the number of cases went past 110,000. So the cases have increased significantly in in many parts of the world, and in some small countries like Bangladesh, which uh, which is really uh, bore the brunt of the infection. Uh, the the disease had spread from the main capital to almost practically the whole country. So this is really a, a big crisis, and the WHO had to. Uh, be on the ground to really help the government. Next slide, please. So in reality, let us sum up where does dengue stand today? Actually, we had a Lancet paper which really said that dengue is one of the only communicable disease to have been transmitted, uh, to have increased exponentially by almost fourfold since 2000. So this graph really illustrates that. The significant increase on dengue, say take it from 2000 onwards, and you can see what happens when the, the cases jump exponentially. And during this period, the cases say starting from 1970s, when we had seven countries affected with dengue, we have now got almost 129 countries affected with dengue. So this is a graph which shows you an yearly average of dengue cases per year during the um, taking it decade wise. And this is really a shocking picture of where dengue is today. So we really need to address this arbovirus and uh, the, the factor which is really hindering this is that is dengue uh, physicians are doing a very good job in lowering the mortality rate and there is a lack of fear factor here. But cases are jumping exponentially in many, many countries. Next slide, please. So in 2020, the situation is also continues to be grim. If we talk of the whole of arboviruses, uh, dengue has crossed to 2 million plus cases. It has also affected many parts of Asia, and I will be touching on them, especially places like Singapore had unprecedented increase in dengue cases. We even have cases reported in um, Laos, Cambodia, uh, India, and so on. The chikungunya cases are unusually increased this year. There is more risk. And what we are seeing with uh, chikungunya today is right now we are dealing with the first outbreak of chikungunya in Chad, 44,000 cases. In Cambodia, we have about 20,000 cases and still expanding. So there are, and today, in fact, today I got information that there is an outbreak ongoing in Malaysia as well, which has crossed 2,000 plus cases. So 
Chikungunya is on the rise in many, many countries. And Zika, there are reports of Zika cases in the American region, which I'm sure my colleagues will brief us in the next presentation. Next one, please. So we have mapped out the, the world basically on the outbreaks of all these four arboviruses, chikungunya, dengue, yellow fever, and Zika. They are affecting a whole range of countries. And as I said, 129 countries alone uh, account for dengue all over the world. And the other are slightly less, but it continues to affect many parts of the world. Next one, please. One of the key factors which is missing our radar is the use of the need for burden estimation. This point I wish to emphasize for the simple reason that burden estimation is the only way by which we can convey to our decision makers the true burden of the disease because 80% of more of dengue and other arboviruses are asymptomatic and we are not capturing them in any health facility. So how do we capture that? We have to have some level of burden estimation either by using our toolkit or by seroprevalence. We, we have that two, two options and we need to do this periodically at least once in two years or three years if possible so that our political leaders and decision makers at the senior level are really aware that the number of cases is far higher than what they really see at the health facility level. Next slide, please. So just to give you an example, WHO has a toolkit on burden estimation. Many countries are beginning to use them. And in fact, some states in India are using them now in a more regular pattern. Uh, this uh, burden estimation overall helps to allocate resources because this uh, burden, once you project the true burden, um, naturally the decision makers can give you some more funds. We, are, we can plan and implement prevention and control measures. We can understand the epidemiology and the spread of the disease. And also it helps um, to understand the economic burden of the disease because it is also significantly high. One factor which dengue is not benefiting much is on dalis because dali is not repre a true representation of the real dengue burden in the world and the suffering the people go through. The This... Uh, on the right hand side, what you see is the true uh, situation in a country where we did burden estimation. The country reported only about 10,000 cases. But if you really look at it, over almost, almost to, at a community level, 1.9 million was estimated. So basically, there's so much of hidden dengue, asymptomatic dengue, which people have suffered. And some places have are now in a position to warn communities, especially children who are affected by the first symptoms of dengue, the first attack of dengue, we need to take additional care so that more uh, prevention can take place and they should be, there should not be any secondary infection. Because a secondary infection with another serotype a few years down the line uh, could turn out to be a severe dengue case. So we need to factor this and this more severe dengue cases come into the hospitals, the more burden it is for the, for the, and the cost for, for the families as well as for the national government. Next one. So basically what we have done in WHO in line with the revised NTD roadmap, which uh, is going to the World Health Assembly discussion this November, uh, we have drafted a global strategy for dengue prevention and control. As you, you know, the previous strategy here on the right hand side, it ends in 2020. So the new strategy, well, basically this is a skeleton of it. Our goal remains the same, is to reduce the global burden of dengue. Next one. And what we, uh, we have three goals. Next one, please. Next slide. Thank you. We have three direct objectives for the global strategy. One is to build capacity at country to detect, prevent and respond to outbreaks. Number two, which is little ambitious, is to reduce preventable dengue deaths and aim for zero deaths by 2030 because many countries have uh, lowered the case fatality rate to less than 1% and we are now in many countries it's less than 0.5% so we can aim for zero deaths in, in reality. Number three is to reduce the burden of the disease in country and incidence by 25%. 
and actually in 2020 in the old roadmap uh, basically global strategy we had a similar goal but we couldn't achieve that because the burden of the disease have increased and uh, but we hope that with new tools coming up uh, we will be able to achieve a, a reduction in incidence in the next 10 years next one please so the technical elements of the strategy is more or less the same we focus on diagnosis case management integrated surveillance and intervention preparedness um, sustainable locally adapted vector control effective and affordable vaccines and number five is to engage and mobilize communities so these are the key technical pillars of this uh, global strategy on dengue next one please in order to enable the success of this strategy we need partnership and resource mobilization we also need uh, inter and intrasectoral collaboration at both national and local level there must be a good regional network and cross-border collaboration between countries because this is becoming more and more effective when the countries or even within a big country if the states or provinces can share uh, information that helps the region to be better prepared because viruses move and we can track the movement of the virus the fourth one is effective communication including risk communication which is becoming playing a major role now in in many of the uh, national programs risk communication and effective community level communication is very very important and last one we really want to emphasize the importance of monitoring evaluation and corrective action because monitoring and evaluation is one of the weakest link in dengue vector control we have done several uh, systematic review but monitoring and evaluation needs to be strengthened as I said earlier, we are sitting in, a, in an exciting period for dengue control because right now in WHO, we have a vector control advisory group or VCAG, we call it. And in VCAG, uh, come the review basically the evidence base for new tools to come into our uh, portfolio. Now, one issue here is that in VCAG, uh, the, the 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 various tools which has come for for evaluation actually some of which is not very clear but i'll tell you the first one is peridomestic residual spray this is an outdoor spraying for um, uh, targeted indoor spraying in uh, in 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 houses this uh, is still uh, has not started their field evaluation the second one is a lot of traps there are um, ov traps uh, as well as auto dissemination traps which are under development and they are going through some very good field studies to generate the evidence base to show that these are, have got impact on the disease. The third one is a sterile insect technique which uh, International Atomic Energy Agency is promoting and uh, this uh, is, is in partnership with uh, WHO and other countries in some areas. And this SIT technology is also uh, are embarking on field trials, and we will hear from them soon. The third, uh, the last one here is the Wolbachia based uh, population alteration. Now, in Wolbachia, we have two types one where we are replacing the population of Aedes with Wolbachia infected population. And this is a technology promoted from Australia by the World Mosquito Program and they have shown quite promising results which has been published recently and uh, these results are encouraging especially their trials in uh, indonesia and they have done several other studies the vcag will get their uh, their uh, results during their next meeting of vcag in early december the other wolbachia is the population suppression model which has been pilot tested in singapore. it is also showing very good results in singapore at the moment and we hope they will go for a randomized study um, to show the public health value of this uh, new tools. The essential issue here is, unlike malaria, where we have bed nets and indoor residual spraying, which are sustainable vector control tools, which are effective for uh, six months to two to three years, we do not have similar tools for dengue. And these, some of these tools, especially Wolbachia, maybe um, the spatial repellents or uh, the the um, the uh, the traps may and even the peridomestic domestic spraying 
may be a sustainable tool for dengue control. We need it badly. And unless or until we have a sustainable tool to augment our existing tools, our situation is still weak. And we hope that these tools will provide uh, additional ammunition to reduce the burden of disease. Apart from vaccines, I have not touched the topic of vaccines, but there are several vaccine candidates in field trial and uh, results are um, will be coming in the next couple of years. So these all these are exciting times and uh, I think we should be optimistic um, that in future probably we will be in a better position to control the incidence of uh, dengue and other arboviruses. Next slide, please. So we had today in the beginning itself the, the problem we are facing today. We are all in the midst of a major pandemic caused by COVID. And uh, actually what has happened over the past several months is there are several countries who are fighting both COVID and dengue at the same time. In fact, in hospitals in India and few other countries, they have got patients with both, both the virus. And you have to deal with a, a double virus attack. And these patients have to be managed extremely carefully. And some of them are still uh, in, in intensive care. So we are in, in a very critical moment where dengue outbreak of 2019 has continued this year. And what has happened is it is affecting the health system. Some patients are not given free access to the hospital due to lockdown measures. And there are instances of few deaths due to that. So this is a very challenging period. Next slide, please. So what we have done from the WHO side is we have been trying to work with national programs to give them a few bullet points to really uh, carry out dengue control measures at the household level. So basically, even if you are under a lockdown situation, a family activity can be to clean up the surrounding and prevent mosquito breeding. And in case uh, vector control staff are able to go door to door after putting their uh, protective clothing, then they can carry out some vector control measures. Similarly, we encourage the use of insect repellents or use of bed nets, especially for people who sleep during the daytime to protect themselves from uh, mosquito bites. Uh, we, uh, because many of the staff in national programs are being drawn to COVID response. So we are, there, is, there are many programs are suffering um, from the shortage of staff and here we are falling back on other sectors. And this is where intersectoral coordination comes into play. We are trying to get the help of community health workers or women's groups um, to initiate dengue response in that communities, wherever they are assigned to. So many countries have succeeded in empowering their community health workers or women, women leaders or even religious leaders to work within the community and reduce uh, breeding, especially uh, source reduction. Now, of course, larvae siding and indoor residual spraying and things can be done if uh, free movement is allowed. And in, especially with uh, indoor residual spraying or uh, targeted indoor residual spraying, we should take the precaution um, to not to spray storage tanks and um, also on the food. And at the same time, we must uh, monitor effectiveness of these sprays. So essentially what we are trying to say here is COVID has opened a completely new scenario for us. We have to retrain staff, some of which are peripheral health workers, or we have to tap other sectors. We are also challenged with some issues, like for example, in some countries in Southeast Asia, um, most of the breeding takes place in plantations, like pineapple plantation or rubber plantation. Uh, and we need to come up with the solutions for this. But at the same time, our, our ammunitions uh, are limited, but with community support and better coordination, we can manage uh, vector control at, at the local level. Next slide, please. So basically to sum up my presentation today, dengue and arboviruses globally needs a programmatic approach. We cannot treat this as an outbreak program. It is not an outbreak program anymore. How can you say a disease which is affecting the population of the world right from 1950s and has silently expanded to 129 countries uh, being an outbreak? It's not. 
dengue is endemic in many, many countries. Actually, over 80 countries of the world report dengue every year. So this is an endemic disease. It needs a programmatic approach, and countries have to be encouraged to have a proper program for dengue and arboviruses. The second point is something which may not be in your radar at the moment. Please remember that by 2030 or in the next coming years, several countries will be faced with acute water shortage due to climatic changes. Water, this, the UN calls it the water stress. At least 30 to 40 cities in the world will run short. And what I have shown in this picture is actually a train carrying water for a population in India. This happened last year. The, the city completely ran out of water. They had to run 20 to 30 trains like this, which is about two kilometers each long, carrying water to the city. And this water stress is a big factor for dengue because people will store water. More and more storage comes into play. So in and around the house, the storing capacity increases. And this is definitely new houses for Aedes mosquitoes to breed. So we are both water stress and flood due to climate changes favors transmission of dengue. Urbanization, as you all know, will be set to increase. By 2030, almost 75% of the world population will be in urban centers, and we will face uh, the problem with that. Can I have the slide once again, please? So the, 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 the overall conclusion is aedes bond diseases have uncertain distribution and burden, and we need to map it out properly with uh, sustained surveillance. Two vectors, two Aedes species, Aegypti and Albopictus, are transmitting more than four diseases. As malaria declines, all these arboviral diseases, dengue, chikungunya, Zika, and yellow fever, are on the rise. The impact of environmental change is significant, and we have to factor this in. The vectors have silently expanded, and there are cryptic breeding sites. So what I mean by cryptic breeding sites, in spite of the best control effort, they continue to breed. And these are really hidden breeding pockets, which uh, well-organized programs are not able to detect. So we really need sustainable tools, better uh, trapping devices to capture these mosquitoes, which are hidden from us and continuing to breed. Many of the current tools do not have the epidemiological outcome or public health value of it, but we are getting new tools also. And we hope these tools will help us in, uh, in uh, providing the uh, weapon for the future and new tools need to be integrated into the sustained control program. So I will stop here. Thank you very much. The next slide is um, also gives you my email address. Those of you who want to contact me, you are most welcome to contact. Thank you very much. Also wish to thank uh, Florida International University as well as PAHO for giving me this opportunity.